Today we're going to start looking at William Blake and specifically at the Songs of Innocence and Experience and also talk a little bit about his other poems which he calls prophecies. Now if you've started reading Blake and you started looking through the Norton Anthology selections, one of the first thoughts that may have occurred to you is, who the heck is this weirdo and why are we being asked to read this stuff? It just simply doesn't make any sense to me. Or even if it does make sense, I don't understand why this is considered literature. And I have to say that you are sharing a reaction that's probably been shared by many people when they've approached Blake for the first time and even after they've studied him for years. However, once you understand what's going on in Blake, his thought processes, his ideas, and how they fit into the social context and the historical context of the time, it becomes much clearer what's going on and it's much easier to follow and you start to realize the brilliance of Blake. I firmly believe in any case, it's always better to know why you're doing something when you do it because once you know why you do it, you know how to do it and you know what needs to be done in order to accomplish what, you're, what you've set out to do. But I also believe that when you approach any text, you need to understand what was going on at the time, why it was written, and specifically why it was written the way it has been written. And I think this is especially true of Blake. If you understand what's going on around Blake, the ideas with which he's surrounded, the people with whom he speaks every day, and also the socio, social, political, historical context within which he's writing, it makes it much easier to understand what's going on with Blake. So we're going to start off by looking at the conceptual, ideological, historical origins of the ideas with which Blake is dealing and how then ultimately we'll look at how they shape his literature. So when we start this process off, the ideas, the ideas that we'll be looking at probably are best most often associated with John Locke. And John Locke is the one who, in his essay concerning human understanding, talks about the idea of the tabula rasa, which we'll be looking at in a moment. And then John Locke leads us to Adam Smith, the professor of moral philosophy at Edinburgh University, and his idea about the origins of moral sentiments. Adam Smith will lead us to the beginning of this period and the very important figures, Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin, who were a couple and who were also famously the parents of Mary Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, and who influenced the ideas behind Blake. Blake was a member of the Godwin circle and was heavily influenced by Godwin's thoughts and Mary Wollstonecraft's thoughts. And then of course, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, who is Mary Wollstonecraft's daughter, and you'll notice that her birth date and Mary Wollstonecraft's death date are the same year, and that's because Mary Wollstonecraft famously died as a result of a con infection contracted in giving birth to Mary Shelley. And then, of course, along with that is Percy Bysshe Shelley. Percy Shelley um, is, was heavily influenced by Godwin and part of the circle and then ultimately eloped to Europe with Godwin's 16-year-old daughter, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, even though he was at the time married to another woman. All right, so let's look at how this progression of ideas leads us to, um, to William Blake and his poetry. So John Locke, in his essay concerning human understanding, proposes that the human mind is really what he calls a tabula rasa, a blank page, as opposed to the way that had been most commonly seen before with the, the, the sense that we have innate ideas that are emplaced into our heads. And his argument is, is that we're born as a blank slate, but then everything that we develop after we're born comes as a result of our experiences. In the essay concerning human understanding, he says this, let us then suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, tabula rasa, void of all characters without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? Whence comes it by the vast store, which the busy and boundless fancy of man has painted on it with almost endless variety? 
Whence has it all the materials of reason and knowledge? To this I answer in one word, from experience. And so according to John Locke's idea, we're born as a blank page. And then all of the information, all of the beliefs, all of the knowledge, all of the things that we gain afterwards come to us by using our experience. So that then produces a lot of other problems. So if everything comes to us from experience, how do you account for all of the various faculties, not only individual faculties, but social faculties we have? How, for instance, do we develop our sense of morality? And I mean, not only our personal individual morality, how we should behave, what, what our appropriate behavior is, but also the cultural sense of what is and is not appropriate behavior. And this is a question dealt with by Adam Smith. Adam Smith was a professor of moral philosophy at the University of Edinburgh, writing roughly 60 years after John Locke's um, essay concerning human understanding. And in fact, he died exactly 100 years after that essay was published. As a professor of moral philosophy, Adam Smith was practicing in the field that we would think of as a combination of liberal arts and social sciences. Human knowledge was basically divided into two categories at this time. There was natural philosophy, which evolved into what we would think of as science. It is the philosophy of how the natural world works. And then there's moral philosophy, which encompasses philosophy and logic and literature, but also fields like economics and the newly developing field really of psychology. All of these fall under moral philosophy. So Adam Smith, because he is writing not only about economics, but also about psychology, actually turns out to be an interesting figure in this case. His most famous work, with which I'm certain that you must be familiar, is The Wealth of Nations, which he published in 1776, an important year. Adam Smith is famously known as the father of modern economics, and he developed the notion of the iron hand of necessity, the sense that we can maximize our our welfare, not only individually, but culturally, by pursuing our self-interest. If I pursue my self-interest and you pursue your self-interest, then we'll balance out our self-interests and pursuing self-interest collectively is the best thing for society. This became this notion that founded modern economics. What is less well known is that before he'd written The Wealth of Nations, he had also written another text called The, Th the Theory of Moral Sentiments. And The Theory of Moral Sentiments is his explanation of where human morality comes from. And if you don't see these two texts as complementary, a complementary pair, you will misunderstand Adam Smith because he assumes that even though we will pursue our self-interest, we are always going to do it following also the dictates of morality, meaning that one does not pursue one's self-interest by harming other people. And morality is always there to serve as a check on self-interest. Now, the question then becomes, how does the theory of moral sentiments contribute to this conversation about how literature works? In the theory of moral sentiments, Adam Smith proposes the theory that we develop our sense of morality out of our ability to sympathize with others. So how does sympathy produce morality? Well, as I'm sure you're aware, the word sympathy comes from the Greek roots, meaning to suffer with. The Latin equivalent is compassion, which means compatere, to suffer with. Our sense, our ability to suffer with other people is what allows us to feel our morality because we don't want to place other people in situations where they suffer because we understand what they're going through and we will identify with their suffering. So our sense of sympathy and our sense of morality comes from our ability to suffer with other people. But in order to suffer with other people, we have to be able to put ourselves in their situation. And in order to put ourselves in their situation, we have to be able to use our imagination. Imagination becomes the origin of sympathy. And this will be an incredibly important concept to keep in mind, not only as we look at Blake, but also as we look at Wordsworth, because Wordsworth believes a similar thing and also places a tremendous amount of importance on this ability to sympathize with other people through the imagination. And ultimately, we'll also see this discussed in detail in Percy Shelley's 
um, defense of poetry. So Adam Smith goes on to explain how imagination produces sympathy in his text. And if you follow along, he says, as we have no immediate experience of what other men feel, we can form no idea of the manner in which they are affected, but by conceiving what we ourselves should feel in the like situation. Though our brother is upon the rack, as long as we ourselves are at our ease, our senses will never inform us of what he suffers. They never did and never can carry us beyond our own person. It is, and it is by the imagination only that we can form any conception of what are his sensations. Neither can that faculty help us to this any other way than by representing to us what would be our own if we were in his case. It is the impressions of our own senses only, not his, that our imaginations copy. And I apologize for putting myself in front of the words there. He goes on to say, by the imagination, we place ourselves in his situation. We conceive ourselves enduring all the same torments. We enter, as it were, into his body and become in some measure the same person with him and thence form some idea of his sensations and even feel something which, though weaker in degree, is not altogether unlike them. His agonies, when they are thus brought home to ourselves, when we have thus adopted and made them our own, begin at last to affect us and we then tremble and shudder at the thought of what he feels. So we have to be able to use our imaginations to place ourselves in the situation of someone else and imagine how we would feel were we placed in those circumstances. And because we understand that we would feel badly if we were placed in that circumstance, then we adopt the sense that placing someone in that circumstance is wrong. And culturally, we abstract from that experience to define that as something that is wrong. So let me kind of show you what's going on here, what this idea is, how it works, and how the imagination works to produce this sense of sympathy. So here we have two stick figures, a happy stick figure on the left and an unhappy stick figure on the right. The happy stick figure sees the unhappy stick figure and then forms how he would feel were he caught in the situation of the unhappy stick figure. And as a result of that, he becomes, he feels the same sensation. So that describes the idea of sympathy that lies behind Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments and how we develop our sense of morality. And it's also an essential idea, not only the idea of sympathy, but the idea of imagination creating sympathy and sympathy creating morality that lies behind William Blake's work and is an essential part of his enterprise in Songs of Innocence and Experience, which we will be looking at later. It also lies behind William Wordsworth's ideas of how the romantic poets can work to rebuild an alienated and disconnected human society. William Wordsworth, who finds um, in his experience of nature, he hears the still sad music of humanity. And the reason he's able to hear that through nature is because nature is what allows him to develop his sympathy with others. Um, where he says that he finds in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the, scent, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. So that's the conceptual, historical, ideological superstructure within which Blake is producing his texts. And I hope it will make it easier when we get into Blake to understand why he's writing as he is and where he's coming from. In order to understand Blake, you really need to understand the conceptual universe within which he's writing. And Blake himself has his own very specific cosmology. It's a very complicated cosmology, but understanding it to a certain extent helps you understand the poems. It's useful to think of it in terms of the Marvel universe and the movie franchise. It's kind of hard to understand how these characters interact with one another if you're not familiar with their relationship to one another within that universe. And that's also true within Blake's own universe or his um, complicated cosmology he sets up within which all of his poems are written.